Good evening, and welcome to Counterculture with Danielle D'Souza Gill. The culture has gone crazy, media has gone mad, and reason has become repugnant. Here we focus on facts and how to fight back. Tonight, we'll be discussing the decline of religion in America in certain parts of the country, as well as the rise of religion in other parts. We'll also discuss how feminism today no longer means what it used to and has taken a turn for the worst. We'll speak with author Mary Harrington about this issue. Viewers of our show know that communism is no friend to Christianity. From its inception, communism saw religion in general, and Christianity in particular, as a dangerously regressive force impeding the revolution. Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin proclaimed that, quote, worshiping any god is ideological necrophilia. And in the years following his party's control of government, the suppression of Christianity in Russia led to the closing of churches and monasteries. This also led to the deaths of thousands of Russian Orthodox priests and believers. Similar bloody and violent purges followed communism wherever it managed to take root. In places like China, Vietnam, and the Soviet Union, the ruling class ruthlessly engaged in a shared project to eviscerate faith from human culture. But over time, there was consistent pattern whereby the government would slowly begin to compromise only to see the faith rise once again from its figurative grave, reborn anew. In Russia, these compromises began under Stalin, of all people. Fast forward to today, and the scene is quite different. The Russian Orthodox Church is now vibrant with millions attending services that were once banned. Marvelous churches survived the purge in Vietnam as well. The Vietnamese government there finally acquiesced and stopped arresting believers and priests. Today, Vietnam remains the second largest population of Catholics in Southeast Asia. In China, too, the government began to relent to some degree by offering a communist version of the faith, though completely co-opted by the government. The Chinese Christian churches represent a type of compromise similar to those that ultimately led to the triumph of the faith over communism in these other countries. Every compromise to Christianity in communist states goes down as the moment a brutally totalitarian government had to wave the white flag of surrender. Communism attempted to bury faith, but in a remarkable turn of fortune, it was faith that was holding the shovel when the funeral procession reached the open grave. The fact is, no ideology has the power to destroy religion. That's because the desire to believe and to worship is our own choice, a decision we make and something everyone thinks about because of a God-shaped hole in all of us. We are born to believe in God. The process of trying to remove that aspect of humanity requires the inflicting of psychological and spiritual violence. You see, for all the lip service the left likes to give to the environment, the reality is that leftism is hostile to nature, especially human nature. Leftism is not a natural philosophy. Like its subspecies Soviet communism, it can't survive on its own. It requires a lot of effort. Things like gulags, secret police, mass arrests, mass censorship, and fake elections. Leftism survived on brute force methods like these because human nature instinctively resists how it tries to coerce private thoughts and beliefs. The instinctual desire to worship God is a universal human trait. Trying to force people to live without God is like telling them they aren't allowed to hear out of one ear. It's a hopeless cause unless you're willing to poke a lot of eardrums. This is one of the biggest lessons we can learn from recent history. But don't count on it being taught in our classrooms. That's because our own country is undergoing a similar process of destructive oppression. Like the suppression of religion in 20th century communist states, America is experiencing a top-down revolution where government and multinationals are trying to squeeze the faith from our lives. The examples are overt, like the FBI spying on churches and arresting pro-life protesters, and they're also covert, like the supplanting of traditional morality in schools and workplaces through the aggressive promotion of secularism, abortion, and the sexual sexualization of basically everything by corporations, government bureaus, and schools. These aren't as explicitly anti-religious in their intent, but it's hard to deny that they normalize anti-Christian values. The closure of churches for COVID, forcing schools to allow men into women's locker rooms, and work benefit packages that pay for employees' travel expenses should they happen to live in a state where abortion is banned so that they can travel to another state to obtain an abortion. 
All of these are examples of an establishment embracing a vision of what a post-religious and specifically a post-Christian America would look like. And because of these efforts, America, it seems, is becoming post-Christian. As we and others have reported before, Christian communities across the country have been losing numbers. Fewer people are opting to identify as Christian and instead self-identify as not belonging to any religion. These are the so-called nuns who have been rising in number for the better part of several decades. Simple minds see this trend and extrapolate how long it will take for religion to completely disappear from America. This would be a reasonable assessment if in fact the trend was the result of some natural turning away from God in general. Luckily for us, the federal system of government means that each state has its own laboratory for democracy. This means that the picture isn't as simple as the media would have you believe. And what we're seeing is that where liberty is strongest and the people are free to live their lives, so too is faith. In fact, we can see strong correlations between regions where conservative ideals have worked to preserve personal liberty and increases in religious affiliation. Places like Florida and Texas, for example, have seen a rise in religious affiliation. In Florida's Miami-Dade County, religious affiliation rose from 40% in 2010 to 52% in 2020. When Trump ran in 2016, Clinton won this county by 30 points, whereas in 2020, Biden received a seven-point margin. In the Texas border region, we see again gains in religious belief coinciding with increasing GOP voter shares. Many of the people moving to Texas and who live near the border are Hispanic with traditional Catholic values, so the woke pro-trans ideology of the left does not resonate with them. In the solidly red state of Kentucky, there was a spontaneous two-week gathering of believers who sang songs and prayed continuously night and day. A revival, if you will. And red state religious affiliation isn't the only sign of a spiritual resurgence. People are increasingly repulsed by the demeaning degenerate policies of the left and have started fighting back. Meanwhile, in the Rust Belt, which is the Midwest, which used to be far more Christian than it is currently, is becoming increasingly secular making it more difficult for the GOP to gain ground in these important swing states. Now that the artificial shackles of Roe v. Wade have been removed, states are free to debate and institute their own regulations and prohibitions on abortion as well. What drives these restrictions is an unshakable belief in the intrinsic value of human life, which for many is the product of the belief in the intrinsic dignity of the supernatural soul. Many who do not believe in the soul are pro-abortion.